This morning, it is a great pleasure to welcome back the Reverend Dr. Margaret Grun Kiven, 61st Chaplain to the United States House of Representatives. Margaret has preached and taught at National on numerous occasions in recent years and is a good friend to many of us. We are blessed to have her and her husband, Tim, and their daughter, Lindsay, as regular worshipers in our congregation on Sunday mornings when we're able to gather in person. Margaret is a Presbyterian minister in the PCUSA. She served as the 26th Chief of Chaplains in the United States Navy. Prior to that, she was the 18th Chaplain of the US Marine Corps and um, uh, has had many chaplaincies prior to that, including at the Naval Academy. Margaret hails from Warrington, Pennsylvania. She entered active duty in the Navy in 1986 following graduation from Goucher College in Towson, Maryland. She received both her Master of Divinity and Doctor of Ministry degrees from Princeton Theological Seminary. Margaret also holds a Master's degree in National Security and Strategic Studies from the Naval War College. And she was a Senior Fellow at the United States Institute of Peace. This morning, we will have a conversation with Margaret about her new job. And for the first portion, I will be asking her some questions that I imagine all of us have. And then we'll have an opportunity to hear from all of you who are tuned in and uh, watching and listening this morning. And again, we'll use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And now, Margaret, welcome. It is really good to see you this morning and good to have you with us. Thanks, Quinn. It's great to, great to see you. I, I feel at a loss not having an opportunity to go into the sanctuary to worship, but uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to be among you today. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's get to it. I've promised Margaret I'm not going to ask her too many tricky or difficult <laughs> questions. We'll see um, if, uh, if I was <laughs> telling her something accurate. Uh, so my first question, Margaret, is um, you, I've never thought of you as a particularly political person. Um, politic, I think, yes, you don't get to be a Navy Admiral without wisdom and tact and perhaps um, being uh, just a, a little bit uh, careful and shrewd. But before this position, what's the most political situation that you could that you would say you ever found yourself in? Oh, man, that's a that's an excellent question. The one I don't even know how to answer. I think you're absolutely right. I am not a political person. In fact, I would often state that I am the most apolitical person that you know. And, and as you indicated, as in the Navy, uh, there's a point where you just don't talk politics. You, you are a, a servant of the country. And as such, you realize that there are other elements, other branches within the, within the government that have responsibility to whom you have, who have authority over you. And so it's not a matter of questioning authority. It's a matter of doing one's duty. So in terms of being in a political situation, I, you know, I, I, I can't even put my finger on it other than I had the privilege of doing a funeral a number of years ago for Admiral Crowell, uh, who had been the chairman of the joint staff uh, and then also had been the ambassador to the, to the United Kingdom. But, um, and there were a number of politicians in that congregation. And I, of course, uh, conducting the ceremony, had the opportunity to see all of them. Only I don't know who people are. <laughs> and so what after that, several people came up to me and said, did you see so-and-so? Did you see so-and-so? I said, well, I saw them, but I don't know who they are <laughs> or which one they were. I so, think you do uh, know more now, though. I, I know more now. And, uh, and I knew who Bill Clinton was. That was good because he was also in the... <laughs> It was one of the speakers that day. So you were so, never in student council in high school or girl state or anything yeah. like that? No, I, no, I, I wasn't. Uh, I, I think I ran for uh, vice president, but it was in student council in junior high, but it was a popularity contest and that was not generally one of my strengths. Um, so uh, how, how did all of this come to pass, this, this new position? Um, I mean, did you read about it in the help wanted section somewhere or uh, how does one learn about an opportunity like this and uh, and what was what was your path. So back in April, uh, I received an email uh, from a sort of a nondescript email uh, by some fellow named Emmanuel Cleaver. 
and there's nothing on the email that indicates who this individual is. It just said, I understand I, your name has been brought forward to be considered as chaplain of the house. If you're interested, please call me tomorrow. So I, I, I was stunned um, and, and wrote back and said, I, I am interested and, and what time tomorrow? And we arranged for the phone call. And then I'm talking to this fellow and not, I was smart enough to look him up uh, on uh, LinkedIn where it indicates that he's a pastor out of Kansas City, Missouri. And I thought, okay, well, that's a little odd, but okay, there's a pastor leading the task force, they called it, we would call it a search committee um, for, this, for this position. And I'm talking to him as if he's just a fellow pastor. And I said, may I, may I ask you who you are? He says, oh, well, I'm a representative from, from Missouri. Well, okay, well, there you have it. So uh, he, it was in fact, the head of the task force and there were three Republicans and three Democrats uh, on the task force. Um, and there were five people being considered, five names that had been brought forward. I, I learned later that Barry Black, the chaplain of the Senate, had put my name forward, as had another organization called the Military Chaplains Association, uh, had brought my name forward. Uh, and I don't know how they learned or how that was, how they were queried, but there it was. And then we, we, I mean, the Presbyterian Church is very familiar with this. The five of us candidated. Well, I've never candidated for a job before, so I, I got significant paybacks on this one because it started in April, and uh, there was very, very little communication throughout the process. Uh, I was told we were going to have interviews that happened in June, so six weeks after the initial phone call, and uh, the, the interviews were done by Zoom, and all six people were there on the on the screen and it was the one of the hardest interviews i've ever had i turned to tim and Lindsay, and i said well i really blew that one and uh, <laughs> but they didn't ask any political questions they didn't ask anything like that it was really a very straightforward um heartfelt interview basically how are you going to get to know 435 of us and what does ministry look like to you and i had put in a a statement of faith and a biography and then um Sometime later in June, they asked for a sermon, and I said, do you want it written, or, or can I send you a couple videos? Uh, so I sent them two videos, and um, then finally, in the end of July, again, a lot of silence, a lot of hand-wringing, a lot of, do I reach out, do I tickle them, do I say anything? And um, finally, in July, Emmanuel Cleaver, Representative Emmanuel Cleaver, that is, uh, called me and said, are you, are you sure you want this job? because it's yours if you do. And uh, so I then had to meet with the speaker and I met with her as well as the minority leader and the majority leader. And uh, the three of them agreed that I was the right candidate and I was notified. Well, that all sort of took place in September, but it wasn't made public until December. And now three weeks later today. And it's very public now. Um. <laughs> it is rather public. So you retired from the Navy Three, four years ago? Two and a half years ago. Years ago. What have you been what did you do in between uh that and and, uh, and this? That's a that's a great question. You know, I, I had a call to ministry when I was very young, specifically to Navy chaplaincy at 17. And and so in in my mind, my understanding of my vocation has always been to be a chaplain. And so I, I stayed in the Navy as long as I liked it and they liked me, but I, I knew that there was something very particular about chaplaincy that, uh, to which I was well-suited, uh, uh, gifted, if you will. And at the end of my tenure in the Navy, and, and there was no, I couldn't stay any longer um, just by virtue of the way the law was written. And, and so I was really, at, I'll be perfectly honest, I was a bit of a loss. Uh, as to what I was doing next, I took uh, several months several months off as sort of a sabbatical, and then I established a little consulting company called Virtue in Practice, where my intent was to do uh, moral, ethical, and spir spiritual leader advisement at the ex executive level. Uh, it was getting some traction, and I was doing some. I had some speaking engagements and had some uh, opportunities to exercise that. And then uh, the Secretary of the Navy's office called and asked if I would speak, if I would work with them on kind of a moral element to sexual assault uh, prevention and response. And so I had a contract with the SECNAV's office for about a year, and that wrapped up this past November. Um, VIP or virtue and practice, you know, kind of kept moving along. And I was, as I say, I was getting uh, 
into the groove of that and then COVID hit. And so unfortunately that came to a screeching halt. Um, and then here we are. Wow. So um, what, what does a house chaplain do exactly? <laughs> so if you read the job description, uh, the, the first and foremost uh, responsibility is to pray. Uh, and it's a uh, it, every time that con that uh, Congress is convened, uh, it's opened with prayer. Uh, now, that what's interesting about that, and what I have since learned, is that the House is convened every third day, but that doesn't mean that all the members are even in D.C. on those days. There and then, but there are voting days, and the members are there all of those days, and the House is convened just about every day those days. But then the days that the representatives go back to their districts, the House still has to convene. And so there's a there's a, a gaveling in, uh, there's a, and, and, uh, a prayer and uh, the Pledge of Allegiance, and it's over. So oftentimes on those days, the longest thing that ever happens in the chambers is the prayer. Uh, so so that's, the, that's the one thing. And, and part of that conversation is to say, well, when you talk about prayer, what does that mean? And as a chaplain, and you know, we've had this discussion before, chaplains really are to be ministers to each and every member there. And while I am in fact ordained by the Presbyterian Church, and I have no intent of um, compromising uh, that faith stance, I do have to be sure that as I pray that every member can say amen. So in some counsel I've gotten, from different camps, um, it's, oh, good, you're going to bring Jesus into the chambers. Well, yeah, J Jesus is already there. Um, and I know in whose name I pray, uh, but I don't, I don't mention that explicitly. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if you listen to any of the House chaplains in the, in the recent past, certainly in the last 20 or 30 years, and if you look at Barry Black's prayers, they are not offered specifically in Jesus' name. Now, that being said, when COVID doesn't exist on those days, which they call pro forma, uh, which are just the, the really short convenings, uh, they'll often bring in guest chaplains. And those chaplains have come from all sorts of different faith traditions. And there's nothing that keeps them um, from, from praying in their tradition. In fact, that's part of the intent is to be able to share, show that we can bring different faith traditions into the, into the chambers. But for me, I'm I am the chaplain of the house, so there are four, you know, at least 435 congregants that I, to whom I am responsible, as well as to their staffs. Mm. So I'm I'm very conscious of how I come across that I would not, not put a stumbling block in front of any of them uh, as they exercise their faith and as I represent Christ to them in my ministry. And so that was a very long answer, and I'm not done yet. <laughs> With respect to what does the chaplain do? Beyond that, um, the job description says, you know, kind of whatever you want. Um, what came across very clearly in the interview process is, is what they want is to be known. And, and, and that, therein lies the challenge. Um, for those of you who have walked the halls of, of the, the People's House, the, the doors of the representatives' offices are closed. So that means knocking on the doors and saying, hi, uh, it's the chaplain, <laughs> just saying hi, let me interrupt your meeting or what have you. And so I, I, I find myself right now at the three week mark, really kind of um, trying to break the code on how does one come to know uh, one's parishioners and, and what does that look like? So for me, it's a ministry of presence. I, I will walk the, the hallways, I have been. Uh, I will make very direct, um, connections with people as I'm able to. I sit in the chambers when they are doing their, their uh, uh, debates, if you will, and during the voting is a good time to, to meet people. So in the three weeks, that's about where I am right now, but I'm sure much will be revealed in the future. And do you have office hours or do you think that works or <laughs> is it better to, to go to, to, to get out there and, and, uh, and reach out in person? I, I think this is what makes chaplaincy us uh, unique is you've got to get out there it to put tell somebody what your office hours are is is uh, a bridge too far for many people aside from the fact that my office is in the basement I have a hard time finding it 
Um, so I'm, I'm not so sure if I even gave people directions, they'd know where to go. Uh, but no, I really do think that the, the value of chaplaincy is being in and among and getting into their places. It's, it's what I did for 35 years. It's what military chaplains, hospital chaplains, uh, prison chaplains do all the time. It's, it's a matter of being where they are, not making them come to where you are. Yeah, that's great. And um, well, you, you've had a, a lifetime and a career full of uh, preparation for this. Um, so uh, I think most everyone watching knows, and a, a heck of a lot more people than are watching know, that January 6th was your third day on the job. <laughs> Um, and uh, what was that like? Uh, I, I'm sure that there will be more questions that will follow, but uh, to, to unpack that. But um, can you just sort of give us a quick overview of what that day looked like for you? Sure. Uh, it was a, it was an auspicious day anyway. Uh, and and by the way, there's an article out there by the Religious News Service, which goes into a little bit more detail than we probably have time for here. But it was just an exciting day anyway, because it was the Electoral College, which we all knew was going to be uh, contested. And a, a lot of dynamics were going to take place there in the chambers. But just to be standing there when the Senate walked in, I, and, you know, I, I joke that I don't know who people are, but I really do. And I, and I saw people. I'm like, wow, I've seen them on TV. Um but see, seeing the, 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 the women walking in with the boxes, which had the electoral votes in them and, and having eye contact with the vice president as he walked in. And uh, it, it was just really, it was ama an amazing day. Oh, by the way, it's Epiphany. And, uh, and I had already prayed and, and I had prayed kind of in my mind, uh, th this was a really uh, wonderful opportunity, you know, that the wise men still seek him um, kind of moment. and. Um, so, so it was just a really exciting day. I was very excited about that day. And, and then uh, when the Senate left to, to debate um, the, the first contested state, uh, then the House began their debates. Well, it wasn't very long before there was a flurry of activity around the, the leaders, the speaker, the minority, and the majority leaders, their, their security teams, um, I have come since to know, uh, had, were, were bustling around them and, and, and hustled them out rather rapidly. And then we were told that the riot that the riots had uh, come into the Capitol and that we were uh, to be a, to move to a different place. Uh, we were told about um, they're, they're not gas masks. They're these hoods that I, I'm not really sure how to be honest. I, I think I, you're safer without the hood, <laughs> but I'm not really sure. Um, but anyway, we pulled these things out. And then what was really, it was two things that were really fascinating about that moment. One is that you, humanity is either duck and cover or run to the fight. And, and that's exactly what happened in that room. But for me, what was fascinating is that the, most of the people who ran to the fight, I knew or could tell were prior military. And, and, and that was just, you know, oh, I know, I know this group. I, I, I got this, I got their number. And then, but one of the clerks at the front of the room uh, looked at me and sort of signed, will you pray? And, and I'm like, well, sure. And so he said, come on up. So I went up to the podium and I prayed. Of course, it was complete mayhem by, at that point. And even with the microphone, there was really no hushing them. But I, I offered a prayer and bless their hearts, the recorders are just tapping away, trying to record this prayer because they're supposed to record everything that takes place in the chambers. Now, uh, I, I will tell you that that fortunately has not gone to the official record. I have seen that transcription, and it's it's not one of my best prayers, uh, but it's rather dynamic. <laughs> but um, then after that was done, then uh, and I found myself sort of torn between do I stay with those on the front line or the other 90 percent of my flock that has just left. Uh, and in, in this case, I did not go with the biblical model to go after the, the, the 10. I went with the 90. Uh, so I, I went with the rest of the flock. Uh, very interesting dynamics there, too. I, some of it was, uh, you know, just kind of patronizing. You know, I'm a woman and all that kind of get me out of the, the, the mess. But there was other and, and this is my experience in the military. There's sort of a, a, a lucky rabbit's foot element to chaplains. And if something bad happens to the chaplain, it's bad juju for the rest of the uh, unit. So there was some of that, like we've got to make sure the chaplain is safe because if she's safe, then we're safe. 
and, and there was, so as we were making our way, wending our way down to our, our location, there was a lot of, oh, the chaplain's here. Oh, that's great. You know, we're, we're you know, we're okay. Um, but then when we got into the room, one fellow, bless his heart, uh, wanted to be Ben Franklin, um, you know, because Ben Franklin in, in the chaos in the late 18, in late 1700s had offered a prayer and it was very unifying and kind of brought people together and, and, and I don't have the exact uh, situation on my brain, but anyway, he, there was a lot of jostling for the microphones. You know, these are these are political folks, and uh, and so he was he was wrestling for the the microphone so that he could pray and bring peace upon the room. And several people looked at me and just went. So I ran up to the microphone and 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 uh, and I and I put my hand on his shoulder and I said, Sir, I I think I've got this. And and so he reluctantly turned over the microphone, but but knew it was the right thing to do. And then I read from Psalm 46, and I prayed then. And in that case, the room did quiet down quite a bit. Um, and and there was for a moment in time a bit of peace. Uh, and what a privilege that was to be able to have that kind of voice in that room. And then when I when I stepped down from the microphone, I then just walked around the room and, and touched base with people uh, mm. for the next several hours. I did think, uh, albeit somewhat later, that I probably ought to send a flare to my family to let them know I was okay. Uh, and but they've come to know me well enough to know that I often forget that, and so they weren't worried yet. So. Um, had you been in any kind of tense combat situations before, um, where there was violence close by? Yes. Yeah. I, so I served in Afghanistan for eight months, and uh, uh, yes. There were several combat moments there, uh, and not to go into a whole lot of detail in those, but uh, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, so I'm gonna ask you, uh, I've got more questions, but everyone else does too. Um, so I'm gonna ask you one last one, and I told you I was gonna ask this. Um, last Friday uh, on the PBS News Hour, there was a piece about General Austin, the new uh, Secretary of Defense, uh, the first Black American to be in that position. And the point, one of the points, probably the main point, was um, about the preponderance of white flag officers uh, in the military and the tendency to promote kind of from within their racial class. And so you're a retired flag officer, and I'm just wondering what your perspective is on, on that uh, pers on that observation that report right well you know in, in your question you you sort of touch on one of the elements and that is that ducks look for ducks you know we we tend to look for people who look like us or who act like us who, who are think like us you know that's true whether we're talking about selecting leadership or or our neighbors or you know what church we go to there there is an element of that um but there's also an element of of um equity with respect to environment and and i and let me put it this way so there's when a when somebody joins the military there's an expectation that they're going to go full tilt that they'll put everything and everything into their their job and you know everything else gets you know uh put to the back burner well uh when you start talking about marriage or parenting or family issues or or moving um health issues uh your own or, or your families those are those are things that you know are are factors when people consider whether they're going to stay or not so a lot of what happens in leadership in, in military circles and i would argue probably in business too is it's it's not so much a matter of recruiting because if you look, look at the numbers for military the recruiting is pretty good it works, it, it's across the board, it's pretty close to the demographics of America. But what you look at later is the retention. And where are we losing people along the way? And, and speaking from a, from a woman's perspective, we lose a lot of women right around, hmm, the time of childbirth, um, you know, when they're trying to build a family, uh, maybe, maybe one child, they make it work, but two children, now we have to figure out, you know, uh, daycare situations and schools and so forth. And that's, those are really hard and reasonable concerns for people. And so the, the, in, uh, 
also, and I was just reading a piece about this uh, today or yesterday, the challenge with uh, many of uh, minorities is that when when you come in uh, to serve your country or whatever, we're, military service that they get paid, you know, a decent amount. But there are a lot of corporations out there who are also recruiting for minorities, and they're offering much better packages. And oh, by the way, you don't have to move. Uh, or to or be separated from your family for months to years at a time. So it's a really hard question to get at. I think the point is that we have to keep asking the question: What is preventing people from from re, from uh, retaining uh, uh, being retained within the military service? Thank you. Um, yeah, that, it's a very helpful additional perspective. So here's a pretty basic question. Uh, do you have a staff or are you all by yourself? Do you <laughs> uh, there's a wonderful woman who works with me. Her, her name is Karen and, and I would be lost without her literally because she has shown me around the building. Uh, but that's it. We are a staff of two. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, just this week, uh, an organization called Faith and Politics reached out and asked if we were going to do some sort of service as a as a rededication to the Capitol or the memorial to the people who were killed in the Capitol or something, and I went, you know, I, I'd love to do that, but I have one person, and I'm not, I, I don't have, I don't have a budget, I don't have resources, I don't have, I, I don't have the ability to do that. Now that being said, the difference between the House and the Senate is exactly that. He has a staff of five or six people, he has a budget. Uh, programming and so forth. And so I, I, you know, there's some thought as do I, do I want to request that same situation or not? But also within the House, there are over a hundred different faith groups who are participating in some sort of ministry within, within the uh, halls of the, of the, of the Capitol. Uh, and so is it a matter of kind of um, pulling them in and, and directing them to, hey, could you work on this part of ministry? Or could I ask you to, to, to take the leadership on this kind of ministry? And I, I still need to feel that out to find out what I'm allowed to do, uh, as well as what's, what's reasonable, and more importantly, what the, what the demand signal is. So a lot, here's a question that, that, to follow up that comment. Um, 100 over 100 different faith groups and presumably um, more than just the judeo-christian tradition mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, do you have a sense of what all of the different groups are yet and um for what you know um how how do you go about uh, ministering to people outside of your own faith tradition right so so really, this is what we did yeah this is exactly what we did in the navy you know, um, when people come to serve their country, they don't leave their faith behind, which I think is one of the things that is so marvelous about our system is that it, it acknowledges that. And to have a chaplain in the house that would help not only to provide for, you know, the other Presbyterians in the house, and oh, by the way, there are, are a handful, uh, but, but to facilitate for everyone's faith tradition. So it, in the Navy, it was a matter, a Navy and the Marine Corps, it's a matter of identifying, you know, who are faith leaders, other chaplains, if you will, or outside congregations to whom you can direct service members for those services. And in this case, it's slightly different in as much as representatives are going home every couple of weeks. And so they're getting, they have the ability to tap into those unique uh, faith traditions. But that being said, it's provide for my own, facilitate for, for, for others and care for all. You know, it's it's really a matter of being able to bring the sense of, you know, the, the spiritual journey that all of us are on and to acknowledge the fact that we're on this together. And how can I help you on your spiritual journey? How can I help you address the situations that you're finding from day to day or from crisis to crisis to tap into your spiritual uh, well? Uh, that's that's really what the sense of chaplaincy is. Now, to your first question, uh, I have this wonderful little book that actually tells me what their faith traditions are, and uh, not not specific. I have to go to each person's biography to to tap into that. But uh, and then the Pew Research has done does a study on every new Congress and gives you a sense of where they are. So predominantly Protestant. Uh, the next would naturally be Catholic. 
uh, and that, but we do have uh, some Muslims and there's certainly a number of Jewish uh, folks represented and I, I know of one uh, Hindu. Um, and I, have, I haven't really spent a whole lot of time looking at the, the details on those yet, but that's, that's my sense of what we have. Thank you, that's, that's very, very fascinating. Um, are there any former House or Senate chaplains uh, that you know of that you consider to be models? Um, who would they be? Uh, why? Um, uh, or do you know that yet? Uh, <laughs> there, there are three uh, uh, former House chaplains who have, or you're the third, who've been affiliated with, uh, with National Presbyterian Church, and of mm -hmm. course, Senate chaplains, uh, one, Chuck Wright, uh, was house chaplain in 2000. I don't know if you uh, had ever met Chuck. He uh, is no longer with us. His wife, uh, Margie, is still a member. Um, but uh, anyway. Great. Uh -huh. uh, so I, I, I haven't really spent a lot, a lot of time studying them. Uh, part of it is I think you know, there are changes each decade. And, and that's essentially the tenure of a chaplain is, a, is anywhere from 10 to 20 years. Mm. Uh, and so what worked then may not work now, but I, I do intend to spend a little bit more time just kind of sensing, getting a sense of, you know, how they pray, because that's saved. Um, now, I have had a chance to talk to people who knew uh, Chaplain Ford, who was three chaplains before me. And, and uh, you know, people have shared what was effective about his uh, style. Uh, uh, Chaplain Coughlin uh, was two before me and I got a, and I've again gotten a sense of his and of course I had a turnover with with Chaplain Conroy. So in terms of models not yet, uh, Chaplain Black of course and I have served together in the Navy and uh, we are in, in communication now and, and I, I, I deeply appreciate his collegial, collegial spirit. He's reached out to me several times already. Great. Um, I'm just continuing to look at the questions. And so here's one that uh, I'll just pose the question. It's asked by an anonymous attendee asking if you see a difference between chaplaincy and ministry. And I think that you're going to say, well, chaplaincy is ministry, but uh -huh. perhaps they mean um, congregational parish ministry, more traditional right. uh, Presbyterian uh, ministry. I, I'm, I'm glad you I'm glad you went down that road, Quinn, because part of the, when I decided to be a chaplain way back when uh, people said, well, why are you leaving the ministry? Uh, honestly, everybody on this call is a minister. Hmm. Everybody is is a minister to the gospel. As soon as you share it, as soon as you live it, you are a minister of the gospel with respect to the more specific question between parish ministry and chaplaincy. I think for me. And, and again, I, I have had uh, about a year's worth of parish ministry in my, in my dossier. Um, but my experience has been, the difference is that with chaplaincy, you are with your congregation every day, hmm. eating, sleeping, breathing, and enduring the same things they are eating, sleeping, breathing, and enduring. The institution is your sanctuary. And, and in that respect, uh, I don't, I don't have to wait for somebody to come to church. I don't have to wait for somebody to come to a session meeting or a committee meeting. Uh, I don't, I, but on the other hand, there's some real similarities. Of course, parish ministers are going into hospitals and are touching base with people and doing weddings and, and some of the, the formal elements to this and, uh, and reaching out. Uh, but for me, I think it's the day-to-day the -day, uh, environment. It, it's, the, it's the sanctuary, it's the institution. Mm. Yeah, that's quite a difference. Um, uh, this one is is a, a pretty personal question, um, and it's asked by uh, Eleanor Hegenbotham. Her father, Edward mm -hmm. Elson, was pastor at National Presbyterian Church, and then he mm. uh, proceeded to become chaplain to the Senate. Um, and mm. she writes that uh, uh, during the 13 years that he spent as Senate chaplain, he and the Senate were sued three times by Madeleine Murray O'Hare, uh, the famous uh, atheist, um, on the whole notion of having a chaplain in the government, and, and she did not yeah. win on any of her lawsuits. Right. Um, is, is that kind of uh, contention um, still a question 
Um, and uh, what is the constitutionality of uh, having a, a religious a professional in right. the House of uh, the, the House and the Senate? Right. Well, Eleanor, I really appreciate the question, and 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 yes, it's it's still a question. It will remain a question. I think it's one of the elements of angelic conflict uh, to ministry in this time, and certainly within the, the uh, within Congress. Uh, and also military service, to be honest. Um, uh, when my when I was first identified as the chaplain, well before the sixth, um, many of the trolls on social media were saying, "Well, you know, why do we need a chaplain in the house anyway?" Um, I think, you know, and I, I need to be a, a little bit more um, well spoken on the, the the elements of this from a from a constitutional perspective, but. It's really come down at this point almost to tradition uh, as opposed to uh, anything beyond that. But the point really is that it's not establishing religion. There's nothing that says that the, that the Congress is establishing a Presbyterian religion because there's a Presbyterian pastor praying today. What they're saying is that religion has a place in our nation not in our government, in our nation, and that, that, that if we're representative of our country and its beliefs, that religion plays a large part in that. Now, to be careful, we have to, to, to acknowledge the fact that there are many who do not follow a religion, uh, that are people of, of no faith. So how are we also acknowledging their voice in this conversation? And that's a harder question to answer. Um, so, Will I? I hope there won't be a constitutional challenge to the position in my tenure, uh, presuming my tenure is longer than three weeks. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I would imagine the question will be raised. And and somebody had asked earlier about the, the religious makeup. I know of two atheists. Uh, one who uh, is a bit of a character and and has challenged my predecessor several times. Uh, and he already warned me that we're going to have some some sporty conversations. So, your your predecessor warned you, or this person warned you? No, this person warned me. He says, "Oh, good, I we'll have some really good conversations." So, oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, we read and hear about the polarized uh, aspects of Congress uh, on a regular, daily, sometimes more uh, frequently basis. Um, so three weeks in, um, what's your experience about how members treat each other when the cameras are not rolling? Therein lies the answer. When the cameras aren't rolling, they're actually very nice to each other. I, I, I have taken different seats in the chamber uh, just to kind of get a sense for the, the, the dynamics in the room. And when the cameras aren't rolling and the you know the debates aren't there, there are people crossing the aisles all the time, connecting with people, and that's just that's just in that room. But but I'm aware of many Bible studies that are taking place, many fellowships that are taking place. Uh, so we're talking now at a very very personal spiritual level, um, and they are bipartisan. Um, some are not, and and they don't like that. They they would like to have more representation from the other side whatever whichever side that is but they they feel very strongly that that in order to move this forward it's got to be uh, we need to be grounded in something that is not related to our politics and many believe that to be faith uh, then there's forced bipartisan elements so that there are committees or caucuses that are put together that are you know five and five or 25 and 25 and i think they discover the, their own humanity there, and it isn't just, you know, lining up on the edges of the, you know, the corners of the ring <laughs> to be able to, to throw their fighter in each time. I, there, there's some real humanity there. Um, but, I mean, this is, this is humanity, you know, and, and you're going to have your, your five to 10 percent who are very vocal, very opinionated, very entrenched in their positions, and they will never be moved. That's going to be on both sides of the. That's going to be both sides of the ring, or aisle, if you will. Um, but the other eighty percent, uh, I don't. I don't see it. Hmm. Well, uh, I think personally, I'd say that's that's encouraging to know. Um, 
I'm going to combine two questions. One is about what your role as a personal counselor is or what you anticipate it. And then a second would be if in a situation, you've already said that you're very careful not to lose your audience when you pray. But if in a personal situation, a person came to you and uh, was exploring Christian faith, um, how would you tell this person about who Jesus is? And oh, what wonderful question. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and maybe not just in your situation now, but um, right. have you had opportunities as a Navy chaplain to, to really lead someone uh, to a personal relationship with Christ? Sure. So, so with respect to personal counseling, I, I would expect that will be as, as opportunity or God uh, makes that um, moment available. And certainly my responsibility is to keep my eyes and ears open to when I might be able to step into those moments or even create them to some extent, uh, because these are very insular people. They're very uh, self-dependent. And, and so to be able to give them a safe space, a sanctuary, if you will, that they know that they can be themselves and can explore uh, whatever it is that they're dealing with, that is very important to me to, to honor, but also to, to encourage. But with respect to that, those private moments, when we're talking about faith, uh, you know, I am unabashedly Christian. The, 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 the cool thing about having been a Navy chaplain is that we used to have this big honking cross on our collar. And, and you know, when, it, when people would come in for counseling, you know, I would work with where they were and where they were coming from. And if we hit this impasse, you know, I would often say, um, okay, we're, we're not getting anywhere. And, and your faith system, not using that phrase, obviously, a, a lot more delicately, but, you know, what you're working with isn't working. Um, would you like to hear something else different? And if they said yes, the doors were wide open. If they said no, then it's like, fine, well, let's work with what we've got and we'll move forward from there. But, but when the doors open, you know, there are no holds barred. And I'm not talking about schwacking them over the head with a Bible, but I, I am saying, you know, I know what my faith tells me. And I could say that to them um, uh, in, in those private moments. Uh, there were several people who came to me saying, I want to know Christ. And, and that was a very, and that was wonderful. And it was everything from, you know, your, your basic sailor and Marine to, a, to an Afghan, uh, a Muslim Afghan who wanted to know Christ. Uh, so yes, I have had wonderful opportunities to be able to, to speak very freely, very openly about Christ. But I like to follow that other adage that, you know, preach the gospel daily, sometimes use words. Mm. So just a quick question. Um, you talked about whacking someone, someone over the head with a Bible. Is there a, an official house Bible? I, I don't know. I don't <laughs> think so. <laughs> I don't think so. I'll have, to sniff, I'll have to sniff that out. It, it may be in the archives across the street. So uh, Ginny Beeson herself, a retired naval officer, yeah. asks, what part or aspect of your naval service best prepared you for this new situation? Ginny, that's a great question. I think it's a little bit of everything. I, I Certainly, um, the um, initiative required of of members of the military. You, you've got to be able to take your own initiative. You just don't sit and wait for things to happen. I think the fact of being a chaplain for 35 years makes a difference. Interestingly, when I talked to Barry Black as I was, you know, as this thing was forming up, and he said to me, he said, you know, when he was being interviewed, one of the things he told the search committee was, you have up to this point uh, relied on uh, individuals who have been tall steeple church pastors and now they're getting ready for retirement and those are the ones you've selected <laughs> to be your chaplain he says what you need to be looking for is somebody who's been a chaplain uh, and and who understands what it means to be in and among people on a, on a you know day-to-day -day basis and not just preaching from a pulpit and, and this is not disparaging parish ministers don't get me wrong but I think to answer your question Jenny it's really having been a chaplain has best prepared me for this job. And, and the 6th of January is a perfect example. Uh, I, I knew exactly what to do. Uh, I, and, and it wasn't a no, it was a no. In my heart, I knew exactly what I was supposed to be doing and did it. Um, I want to combine two questions. Uh, 
about what your um, goals are, uh, what your hope uh, is in terms of aspirationally what you might accomplish. Um, mm. And so I'll just read them. What's the most important goal in this new position? And the follow on do you plan to make both parties, do you plan to make both parties members work together, help our president to unite the country? Um, uh, and then following up, uh, do you see healing some of the current divisions and political ugliness as part of the right. job? So um, one might be a little bit high, but uh, but seriously, um, th there is certainly some uniting that could happen. And what might your role be in that? Thank you. You know, it, that has been funny when, when I've told people about this job. Many people have said, oh, good, you're the one who's going to bring everybody together. And I'm like, um, yeah, no, I don't think that I don't think that's in my in my wheelhouse. However, I do represent the one who can. And uh, I, I think, you know, if, if talking about Daniel, if you will, uh, I hear that when the king says, I hear you interpret dreams. No, I don't. But I, I work for somebody who does. Uh, and and I and I kind of feel that way with respect to unity. I, I, I work for, for someone who understands what unity is. And so if God uses me in that regard, then all the better for it. But it, 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 I would predict that it isn't going to be me as much as it is to me to be able to encourage the entire uh, faith believing community within those walls to start there. That, that would be my job, I think, to encourage people to use their faith in making their decisions and not just to posture for the sake of the next vote. It's a tenuous position that they're in. They're, they're already, I mean, they just, just got sworn in. There are several people who are already starting their campaign for the 118th Congress two years from now. And that's a terrible position to be in. It, to, you know, that your job security is based on, you know, how you present yourself, not necessarily how you believe. And, and that's a, I, I don't envy them at all. So my role, my goals, if you will, in that is really to help people to, to realize that where they are is where they need to be, not where they want to be, uh, but where they are is where they need to be thinking and, and putting their energies because God is using them now. And, and if God chooses to, to use them in the next session of Congress, all the better. But if not, God is using them now. And, and to be able to put that sense of, um, the present, their present purpose as it's grounded in faith. Uh, that would be I, I, a goal I, I have. My, the, the, but the overall goal is to get to know them. I mean, I, I, this is a little selfish. That 6th of January event was, I, don't get me wrong, was an answer in some ways to prayer in as much as to walk in that place and say, how do I get to know 435 members and their staff quickly enough that I establish a, you know, a, a ministry that's viable um, as quickly as possible. Well, meeting several hundred of them in one room uh, under crisis is a, is a pretty good start. And, and so my, now my goal is, is really just to how, to how to build on those relationships as well as to uh, really enter into the, the lives of the congregation. Um, I, I want to use this question to, to ask you a, a broader one. The, the question is, do you have a favorite devotional or spiritual book other than the Bible that you uh, would recommend? But my broader question is, what kind of interior spiritual life uh, is, do you think is necessary for the kind of work that you're called to do? Well, let me answer the second question first. Um, you know, I, I, I pray. I, I would argue I'm not a very good personal prayer. I, I much rather rely on other people to be my prayer warriors. Um, I find prayer to be such an intimate moment that sometimes I find myself speechless, mm. and and you know, and not having words to put before God, uh, and and that in some ways it's very paralyzing um so to stand in front of a camera because there aren't always people in the room uh in front of a camera and have that kind of intimate moment uh is really daunting i'll, I'll be perfectly frank and so um 
one of the things that Barry Black has indicated uh, that he does is that he prays the Psalms before he writes his prayer. Mm. And uh, I have found myself not being quite as as um, regimented as that as much as it is to say I, I, I am listening more now for scriptures that are brought forward. I mean, even as simple as you know, this, you may think it's really odd. I mean, it's, sometimes it's like my devotion and it's very clear because I, I, I read scripture every day. I have a devotional I use every day. Uh, but, and sometimes that speaks to me and, and that helps to generate things. But it, it could be something as simple like it, it just came across uh, in the last couple of days, uh, George Washington's famous uh, quotation that every, every man will sit under his own uh, fig tree. Uh, and under his own vine. Um, that's a powerful statement from Micah, the chapter of chapter four of Micah, four through six. And, and that's what's been ruminating in my mind. And I'm thinking, how do I use that? How can I use that and allow that to speak into whether the next prayer or the not the next prayer, but you know, any prayer to follow? How do I use that? Um, and uh, so that's kind of how I've been, my spiritual life is allowing scripture, and it really is, it's 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 something I have to actively do. Allow Scripture to speak in use to give me the words that I am sometimes lacking, yeah. uh, and and God has been very gracious up to this point uh, to make those fairly clear. Uh, devotional, uh, I I have been using John Bailey's devo devotional. Uh, I don't remember the title of it right off the top of my head, but Diary the other one, prayer. yeah, Diary of Private Prayer. That's the one. I use that every day. I've been using that. Uh, I, I've wor worked through that at least five times now, and that and I uh, really enjoy that. Uh, the, the other, from a um, from a broader perspective, a book that I've read several times is "Strengthening the Soul of Your Leadership," um, and Ruth Haley Brown. Uh, so I commend that to you as well. Ruth Haley Brown or Haley Barton? Barton, sorry, Barton. Me and my memory for book titles. I'm glad. I'm glad you're the book guy. <laughs> um, here's a great question, I think, from a, a, a professional woman who's a mom. How have you balanced your work as a chaplain and a mom, especially in the military with a young family? But now, of course, L Lindsay is a, a, an adult, but um, you're still a mom and, and a wife. So uh, what, what does that balance look like? Well, it, it's 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 often been imbalance. I will be perfectly frank, and uh, I think that's why there are two of us in parenting, uh, because Tim can pick up where I fall off, and vice versa. Uh, we are also graced with an amazingly mature young woman, uh, who even so at nine eleven, and I was stationed at Quantico uh, on nine eleven. Um, so I I was not at the Pentagon. However, all chaplains in the NCR were called into DC into the old Navy annex, so that we could go forward and do death notifications. So I was putting my uniform on that afternoon. Now Lindsay was four at the time, and uh, she said, "Mommy, mommy, why are you putting your uniform on? Where where are you going?" It was I don't know six at night, and I said, "Well, Lindsay, that some very bad things happened today, and I need to to go talk to people who may be very sad." And she says, "That's that's where you need to go, mommy." Mm. I, we love you. And that's been her attitude all along. You know, it's not without loss on her part. And, and you know, there are moments when she's particularly mad at me that those will come out. But uh, in the grand scheme of things, Lindsay gets it and always has. So, uh, you know, how do we do it? And, well, God did it. God, God graced us with a very strong family uh, with a lot of ability to communicate and support one another. and. Uh, Professionally, I've done whatever I can to be there at those important moments. Uh, and thankfully, God has in his province made me available for some unanticipated, un very crucial moments in, in Lindsay's life. Uh, and I was, it, and where I, when I haven't been there, it's, it's been okay. So it's, that's a hard question, but a, but a really, a reasonable one. So uh, here's a question from another anonymous attendee um, about plans for the first 100 days. Many have them, including President Biden. Uh, mm. Margaret Kibben have a plan for the first 100 days. Yeah, so 
you know, I've been sitting on this news really since July and, and I had a couple confidants who were trying to ask me that same question. Well, frankly, I don't know this environment. I don't, I don't, you know, when, when you make a plan, one, one presumably understands the, the situation into which you're walking. And I, I don't, I, I don't know, I don't know how things work. I don't know these people. I don't know their sense of things. So um, I have not, I don't have a specific hundred day plan other than to be, to use these first 90 to 100 days to get to know people, to say, I'm not just going to sit in my office and wait for them to find me and just pray, you know, when they say, and the chaplain of the day is, no, it's to go out and get out and get about and find, and get lost, which is really easy, to get lost in the capital. And one goal is to find my way back. But the other goal <laughs> is to talk to as many people as I can along the way. And, and so, um, Part of what I wanted to do is connect with every representative within the first, I think it's probably more reasonable to say year because there are 435 of them, uh, but to make some sort of connection with them um, in, in whether it's a note, whether it's a visit, uh, but to be able to take my little directory and check off and say, yes, I wrote a letter to this person, or yes, I had a conversation with them so that I can really get a sense of who they are and what this congregation is made up of. So we're um, at the hour and you've agreed to take a, a little bit more time. And so we're mm -hmm. grateful for that. I just want everyone to know that uh, I do have an eye on our schedule. Um, this is a question um, and it's not, it's really asking how do Christians, I, I presumably that's who, it, or how does anyone, but particularly how do Christians pray uh, for our country, um, and, and maybe just generally, mm -hmm. given all of the division that we mm -hmm. see, and of mm -hmm. course it's, it's manifested at least when the cameras yeah. are on in Congress, um, and, and among some, you know, the 20%, as you mentioned earlier, uh, um, what, what, what guidance can you give us in our own prayer lives? Well, to pray, <laughs> it's pro I think that's probably the, you know, the, the first step. I mean, I think we, we I can say uh, before this, when I would do that line of, I we pray for our leaders, uh, that, that rang uh, empty for me. It doesn't ring empty for me anymore. Um, th these people are, they are representing our country. And if you stop and look at the divisions that are you see on C-SPAN, those are clear and present evidence of the divisions in our country. Mm -hmm. And so when we pray for our leaders, what we're doing is we're praying for ourselves as neighborhoods, as congregations, as communities, as, as a country. And, and our prayers have really, God will hear our prayers. Um, Second Chronicles 7, 14, you know, I will hear your prayers and and heal your land. Uh, we we've got to lean on those promises, uh, even when the evidence rings counter to that. Even when C-SPAN is showing us, you know, no no proof that our prayers are getting traction. Um, that I think has got to be the the first part. Is we've got to be able to be heartfelt in our understanding that who we are within our communities. Uh, is being represented represented in the house, but it also means praying for our own communities. So how are we serving, and how are we best serving and representing Christ in our communities, so that our communities will then represent the love of Christ, so that then our representatives can represent our communities, which are representing the love of Christ. Mm. Wise words. Um, several have. I uh, just wanted to say uh, our, our warm and deep congratulations to you uh, for this honor. Um, maybe we should say some condolences, but I don't think so. Um, you strike me just, I've, you know, we've known each other for the last eight years, at least pretty well. Um, and I, I just think that this is a great fit for you, and I could not be more pleased that you're doing it. And so I would add my personal congratulations. And there's also a sense that um, 
we would love as the place where you worship um, when we can worship in person. Uh, you're, we're, I suppose, more your church home than other places. Um, we can pray for you. We, we will pray for you. We do pray for you. Um, but what else might we do to support you? Is there anything? Well, I do covet your prayers. Um, that's become my famous line now. I, you know, people have sent wonderful notes, and I'm very grateful for their kind words and words of support. But I, I covet your prayers because this is the only way I'm going to survive. This is through your prayers. Um, I think at this point, I don't know what to ask for, and and <laughs> part of it's just ethically. One of the things I'm feeling hamstrung by, and and this is worthy of prayer too, is that there are hundreds of people who want to do something, um, and I, I think, oh, great. Well, they're really good at this. Let's call them in to do that. Well, I, I, but ethically and legally, am I allowed to do that if it looks like I'm excluding somebody else who also wants to present something to the Capitol? So I'm, I really need to be able to figure out how to navigate this world of, of wonderful contributors to this ministry and how to leverage them uh, appropriately so that the, the ministry to the capital is rich and, um, and varied and representative of, of the support that's out there in the faith communities. Um, so uh, I'd, I'd appreciate your prayers there. And, and beyond that, uh, I, I don't know, certainly being uh, ready and willing to take something on uh, is, is certainly helpful, but I don't know what that looks like yet. Um, I good friend of ours wants to make sure that you realize that the Micah quote um, was referenced by Amanda Gorman in her poem and that it was uh, acknowledging uh, 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 a shout out anyway to the musical Hamilton. You probably right. knew that, but. Uh, yeah. um, and, and do you know that George Washington, I've just read this today, George Washington used that at least 50 times in a number of his speeches. And uh, that that was, that he's, quoted scripture quite often uh, as he spoke, but that that particular one uh, was of, of great import to him. And, and I think all the more reason why it's so impressive that Hamilton pulled it out and, and used George Washington's character to present it um, and, and because it was so important to the, the founder of the, the founding president of our country. And I think the one who provided for chaplains in the military. Well, yeah, <laughs> and then there's that. Well, Margaret, this has been uh, a, a delight as it always is, but a particular delight um, to be able to do this with you uh, given the times that we find ourselves in. Uh, it, it is an overused, uh, taken out of context Bible verse, but I'm gonna say it anyway, for such a time as this. Uh, <laughs> One of our mutual friends on uh, Facebook suggested, uh, oh, a couple of weeks ago, in the midst of all of uh, everything happening, that that your name really is Esther. Um, <laughs> well, uh, it, I want to pray for you, and I know that many people want to join me. So uh, we'll close with this word of prayer. Let us Thank pray. You. Gracious God, uh, you are active in all our lives. And you call each of us, as Margaret has said, to be involved in ministry. But today we give you particular thanks for our sister in Christ, Margaret Kibben, for her faithfulness to you, her stewardships of the gifts that you have given to her, and for her alertness and discernment to the movement of your Holy Spirit in calling her to ministry um, and to chaplaincy, and now to this very important place of servant ministry in the life of our nation at this particular time and place. Lord God, bless Margaret in the work that she does. Give her great wisdom, compassion, energy. Bless her efforts to reach out to all of her flock, all 435 of them and their staffs. Provide for her uh, in every way that is necessary uh, with 
with resources that she does not yet know exist um, and with, with just a, a deep sense of trust in you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so very much for that prayer and, and your continued prayers. All right, Margaret. Well, it's great to be with you. And, and we will uh, look forward to the next time when we see you, whenever that might be. Here, here. Thank you all. Blessings on all of you. I look forward to the next time. Okay. Well, bye for now. Bye-bye for now. Thank you.